Welcome to Good Life. I'm Dean Wilson. So glad you've joined us. And uh, wherever you are around the world watching a Good Life TV, we we welcome you. Uh, you can always go to goodlifetelevision.org and where you can see all the episodes and all, along with a lot of power clips. And if you're joining us on the podcast, Good Life Conversations, we welcome you as well. We're so glad you're with us. We have a special guest today. I'm really excited to talk with her. Monique Dupuy is with me. Monique, welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. So Monique is in Winnipeg, and Monique and I have something in common, which is we're both parents of children with special needs. And we have been in this world for many years, and, um, and we want to talk a little bit about Monique's journey. And, and so first of all, Monique, just tell us a little bit about kind of your you know, family and background before we get into your journey with Zakari? Sure. Um, I'm a mom of three. I have my oldest, who's going to be 16 soon, Wesley, Um, my stepdaughter, who's going to be 15 this summer, and my youngest son, Zakari, who is eight, going to be turning nine in a couple of months. And um, I started the Doman kind of journey with my oldest. I taught him how to read. Um, He was diagnosed with autism at a young age. Um, But at this point now, he can attend regular high school. He's taking regular classes. He's super bright. Um, Most people don't even know about his diagnosis. And um, when my youngest came along, he um, he's a spitfire. He threw us for a loop. Uh, we did a lot of the same things with him um, that we did with my oldest, but it just, we needed more. And so we started working uh, with Doman International. But yeah, yes. so I run a home daycare. Um, and yeah, I live in Winnipeg in Canada. And, and, and by the way, we want to point out your YouTube channel, Early Learning Mom, if you're a, if you're a mom out there watching this. So and when we refer to Doman, what we're talking about is there's an organization that we partner with called Doman International. You can go to domaninternational.org, D-O-M-A-N, international.org. And these folks for decades, literally, uh, you know, decades have been helping families with a special needs child learn how to help their child. One of the things that happens when you bring home a child with special needs is you ask yourself, what do I do? (laughs) How can we help? And it can be very overwhelming. It can be very intimidating. It can be very, um, there can, there can be a lot of despair and hopelessness in this world. And I think Monique, you'd probably agree with that. I mean, if you, mm-hmm. especially if you don't have answers, but let's talk about the story of your youngest Zakari. So Zakari is born. There's a difficult pregnancy. Uh, thankfully he made it to 37 weeks. You had, you had some kind of a, a misdiagnosis or mis misleading medical advice regarding some medicine that was given to you. Um, And then he ends up, you know, being delivered. He's blue. He's, he's, you know, not in good shape, um, but was resuscitated. Yes. And then you end up going home and, and I was reading kind of about what he was doing, where he was when he was about four which I, I, I believe that there's a mom or a dad out there right now who's watching who may have an autistic child or a child with developmental disabilities who may be exhibiting some of these symptoms. And I think it's powerful to talk about the before before we get to the after. So yes. Monique, ta- walk through kind of where he was when he was four, what he was doing, because I know you, bec- you kind of got to a, a, a little bit of a breaking point. Um, in terms of, you know, <laughs> what do we do here? So just talk, talk through kind of where, where you were then. Um, well, Zakari was super, super hyperactive. Um, and when I say hyperactive, I don't mean just like a busy body. I mean, we're, we're talking danger, probably at around the age of three in the middle of the night, he got out of his room there, there was a gate up and everything. And I heard my microwave beeping in the middle of the night and I came in to find him standing 
on the stove. He had turned an element on. Luckily, it hadn't gotten hot. And he was playing with the microwave. Oh, and man. so now I'm at the point I can't sleep because I don't know if he's safe. I can't. Um, it's very difficult to leave him with anybody because the second you turn your back, he's into something. He's pouring something. He's um, running um, we had a tutor at one point um, that was working with him. We were doing some ABA and she was, I told her, I'm like, when you go outside, you need to make sure you have his hand. And, oh yeah, yeah. I work with lots of kids and he broke free from her and ran into the street. And luckily there was no cars, but this is the stuff we lived with. We were fearful when we were invited anywhere because we didn't know if he was going to be safe. And we had to walk with a death grip on his hand um, just for his safety. Um, and yeah, so at that point, um, he was very also aggressive because he couldn't vocalize what he wanted. Um, he's an extremely bright child, but he couldn't, um, he could, he would get frustrated very easily. And, um, we had scratches from frustration on, from him on us, um, bites. I had to be very careful with him around other children. He loved other kids, but, um, if he got frustrated, he would bite. And so we were at the point, we just really didn't know what to do. And, um, yeah, it, it was really difficult. It was very difficult on my mental health. Um, and obviously on him, it wasn't, um, it, it's no life to live when you, you can't um, protect yourself and you don't, right. you, you're just the impulse control was so difficult for him. Right. So, yeah. and, and it's not a parenting issue. Let's be real clear. I mean, I think that's one of the no. things, about, that's one of the things about yeah. some of these, whether it's autism or hyperactivity or ADD or whatever it is that sometimes people, I think, can look at and go, gosh, you know, get your kid under control. That is not yeah. possible. <laughs> so, that, I mean, that's so, frustrating for yeah. me. Um, I had sure. two older children that are completely well behaved. I could take them anywhere. And I got comments, not directly to me, but um, other people would say behind my back, well, if she would just spank him. He <laughs> wouldn't touch the TV. He wouldn't do it. And it's like, honey, no, like if right. that, that's first First of all, I don't do that. Second of all, even if I did, it wouldn't work. Like right. it's not, it's a brain issue. It's not a behavior issue. Right. So, yeah. So the, the symptoms you talked about biting is scratching, constant hyperactivity, destructive, breaking things, um, not able to converse, couldn't, couldn't follow simple instructions. Uh, he was bothered. The noise was a huge issue, which I think is very common for, for this mm -hmm. situation. So he was constantly covering his ears. Can you imagine just being tortured by that? I, that is yeah. just so painful to think about. Uh, didn't care who was around him. Um, didn't crawl till he was 11 months, was a late walker at 16 months. And then um, you were living in constant fear of him sneaking off or getting away, which I think is just a parent's nightmare. So that's where we were. <laughs> so yes. then you end up going, getting in touch with the Doman International friends. Talk about what did they do? What did they tell you to do? What did you do? What is, sometimes we talk about the Doman method or the program and people go, well, tell me what that is. You know, we, you and I know, yeah. but talk through. So you get home from Doman. What do you start doing with Zakari that starts to turn this situation around? Um, I think I think it's important to know that we start Zakari technically was on a Doman program from birth. We did do reading with him. Um, so he was reading and um, you know doing all of that stuff at a very young age. So we kind of had the upper hand there. Um, but when it came to the physical, uh, it was the physical program and the respiratory program that really um, helped organize his brain, the creeping, the crawling, the um, productive running, um, doing that kind of stuff. It helped organize his brain in a way that he could settle down and um, he was getting more oxygen to his brain. We changed his nutrition program, like we changed his foods um to a gluten-free dairy-free um low sugar 
and um, artificial coloring free diet. And that made huge changes in his behavior as well. Um, making sure that he had the proper nutrients going in, proper supplements. Um, and we started noticing a difference. I think I, we took him down in August um, for his first assessment. We had been, I had taken the course a year before and we had I started implementing the stuff that I had learned during the course and people were already noticing a difference in him, but we kind of hit that point where I needed more help. I needed more like of a refined program. And when we came back from Philadelphia, it was just huge changes in him. He could sit down and, you know, read a book with me. He could, um, he was sleeping better. His stomach issues were, were getting better. Um, and he stopped hurting us and he started using his words. And I remember a birthday party that we hosted for him because we had stopped hosting birthday parties for him because it was just too overwhelming. And I'm like, this is supposed to be about him and he's not enjoying it. And finally we were able to host a birthday party and he was able to tell me when we were opening presents that I had enough, like I need a break. And he needed to break away from the group instead of having a meltdown and freaking out and crying and hurting right. people. He, he vocalized, I need like all done. I need a break. And we were able to step back and um, wow, our family is just amazing. And they were totally fine with us, you know, saving the rest of the presents. They wanted him to enjoy it. So we waited and then we did them through video so he could do one at a time with a lesser, crowd but he was he's able to enjoy birthday parties now for himself and others and um, he actually told me last year that like he suddenly got really into firefighters his uncle's a firefighter and we can go to their open houses now and he enjoys that and he told me he wants to be a firefighter when he grows up where wow. before he didn't care for anything like he didn't have any special interests and now he does Wow. Yeah. And I'm reading. He, so he stopped his, his clothes. I think I'm, I'm yes. guessing it was his sensitivity to touch. Yeah. So, which is a brain issue. So he would take his clothes off, but yeah. he stopped taking his clothes off. Yes. Um, he, we used stopped. a program. Yeah. yeah. We did a program with that and it totally helped um, him. He can wear clothes now. I mean, he still prefers to play outside in just his like, you know, uh, bathroom basketball shorts and stuff but we have a rule that he has to wear pants and he's cool and he's cool with that rule now and, we have the uh, same rule in our family yeah we try to keep exactly. everybody with pants on yeah um, but so he calmed down so, so you're saying i mean this nutrition program this tactile program this breathing program mm -hmm. combined with creeping crawling or brain organization he calmed down as a person Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Um, he is just a pleasure to be around. He's silly. He's goofy. He's, but uh, he's just like a fun person to be around. Like it's, it used to be very, very stressful to be his mom because I was scared. Like as his mom, I'm responsible for his well being, And I felt like a failure because I, he was constantly getting himself in danger. And right. now it's enjoyable. Like we, we have, re, we have routines and relationships and, you know, um, he knows when certain people are coming over and he has certain um, activities he knows that he goes to and, it's just, he's a different kid. Isn't that amazing? And he went, he, this kid who has ultra sensitive hearing ends up going to a Winnipeg Jets hockey game with 15,000 yeah. screaming people and he was okay. He was fine. He had his ear defenders on, but he was, he was just screaming with them. Like he was having a blast. Oh. Like we won tickets and, uh, it was amazing. He loves his jets and um, it was nice for him to have the experience to, you know, go sit down and actually watch a real game instead of just on TV. Right. And so now after, so you ended up having a second appointment. And so now he goes across the monkey bars. He's able to go across the monkey bars. Yep. He reads whole, whole homemade, homemade books in his head and answers comprehension questions 
says thank you without being prompted. Um, and he's developed stronger relationships with his family and his friends, you said. He's excited when his grandparents come over, his cousin. Or, so that's a change because now it's almost like with these symptoms reduced, you have a person and you get yeah. to meet. I mean, is that kind of what's happened for you? Yes. We get to see who he is and um, just his, yeah, his personality, his favorite books, his favorite, like what he likes to do, his activities. Um, yeah. It's just amazing. Yeah. This, yeah. this whole world. And I, I wanted you to comment on this just because I think you and I have had the same experience. And before we came on today, we were both talking about how we can't imagine our life without Doman <laughs> just because yes. we were drowning. And then it's like somebody throws you a life raft, but but to the parent who's out there who, and, and I know a parent like this, actually, um, I know a parent whose autistic child literally takes his clothes off and runs around the neighborhood. One time ran into the naked. neighbor's house naked, you know, Wow. and you're going, <laughs> what do we do? And, 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 and I think so often the parents, whether it's sensitive, tactile issues, the hearing thing. The, just the behavioral thing in general, we're all trying to treat the symptoms when mm -hmm. we need to treat it at the brain level. I mean, I think that's the, that's the probably, if, if you're going to like cut the Doman method, the Doman work over decades down kind of into one succinct description, it would be, we got to treat the brain. You want to you want to get to the tactile? Why is he taking his clothes off? Treat the brain. You want to figure out why is that? You know how do we deal with this hearing? He's he's going crazy. He can't. He's so sensitive. You got to treat the brain. And then even the nutrition stuff. You mentioned his stomach issues. I don't know what that was. We had constant respiratory issues. We changed the diet, and all of a sudden they're gone. Yeah. I mean, it, which is incredible so anyway talk talk about it just we only have a few minutes left but talk about treating the brain and how what kind of revelation that has been for you and in, in, in terms of your understanding your son yes um treating the brain yeah uh, uh, some of the programs that when we were introduced to like the creeping and crawling i'm like he can he he's done that like he's running and right. jumping and climbing why do we need to creep and crawl and then understanding how it's the cross patterning and it's helping organize the brain um getting him down on the floor doing the little tummy crawls and the hands and knees crawls and the monkey bars um you can just see that his chest is getting bigger um right. which gives more room for oxygen which in his, for his lungs to take in more oxygen, which gets more oxygen to the brain, which helps him function better. And I can look at him and I can compare him to other children on the spectrum who tend to be, um, and I'm generalizing here, but you know, a little heavier set because they, they're not getting these experiences to exercise their bodies and burn that energy off. And I look at Zakari and his physique and he is like, we call we say he has the Spider-Man build. He's thin, but he's just pure muscle. And that yeah. muscle is helping pump blood throughout his body, getting that oxygen to his brain. And I can tell when we have, um, when we get in all our brachiation, um, he's not crawling anymore. We're doing running. Um, we've graduated to running and um, doing hikes and stuff. Um, but when I get in his runs, his brachiation, um, you know, even his uh, cognitive programs, like his typing, he's typing now. Um, he is calmer in the evenings. But if we miss some days, like, you know, life takes over. He, he doesn't he almost doesn't know what to do with this energy. He wants yeah. to do the program so right. he can get the blood flowing and his brain can start, you know, continue working the way it needs right. to. So, yeah, right. we, we definitely noticed um, by treating the brain, um, it eliminates a lot of these symptoms. And sometimes there's something that you'll be like, well, he hasn't done that in a really long time. And you don't even notice because you're not treating that symptom 
you're treating the brain. Right. And then sometimes it doesn't make sense because what you just said, your, your child mobility was not the issue. He was running, jumping. He was, it was too much, (laughs) Yeah, you know, and yet here you are creeping and crawling as a way to organize the brain and just sense to me. And then you do it and it works. And you're like, okay, I don't know why this, I don't understand this, but results is what we're looking for. So if my child improves, I mean, Ella Claire, our daughter, you know, Monique, she is so happy doing the program. Just like what you said about Zakari. It it is like just the right thing. She's, she was up this morning at six o'clock. She's up. She calls, she says, dad, I'm up and at him. And she was ready to do the program Uh last night after a full day of doing the program and my wife is just a saint, you know, with this as are you, but after a full day doing the program, she's always saying things like, I'm just so proud of myself and all my accomplishments, Uh you know? And, and I realized this is not just, it's not just about the end result and okay, we were here and now we're there. It's this journey. It's about the journey, you know, that every day, there can be more sense of fulfillment and accomplishment. And because I'm doing this, does that make sense to you? Absolutely. You can see the pride um, when like our most recent um, victory has been his typing. And before, if you presented him a keyboard, he'd just be banging on it, pulling the keys off. And now he sits there and he's like, okay, what word? what word mom and (laughs) like he's you can see him like just squirming like okay tell me and he's typing couplets and he's just sitting there like so focused and determined and even six months ago that would not have been possible and afterwards he's just so proud of it that he 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 did it and you know dad will come home and I'll be like hey do you want to show dad you're typing and he's like yeah I can spell daddy and then he shows him I can spell frog (laughs) And he shows them and oh, it's, so it's just beautiful. so amazing. And this is the kid that they said, oh, I'm sorry. He has a low IQ. We don't really know what he's going to be able to do. And it's like, dude, he reads better than you. And he's three. Like, how can he have right. a low IQ? Right. Like, right. Um, <laughs> he just doesn't want to participate in your little games that you're doing right now because you don't know how to evaluate a child properly. Um, right. right. But then we go to Doman International and they're like, okay, you realize how high of a reading comprehension this kid has? And he's, they're pointing out all his strengths. And right. so while they're working on the weaknesses to help bring that up, and that's our end goal, they don't just ignore his strength that he's a brilliant reader. Right. And um, they, they keep feeding that. Yes. And so I think that's what's great is they, they don't only look at the, the, the where most systems look at what is your kid defective in and well we're not going to work on the stuff he's good at because he's already good at that and it's like well what about his self-esteem what about you know his passions like right so that's what I really appreciate about Doman International is they they work with his strengths and use that to build up his weaknesses so if you have a special needs child, we encourage you to go to domaninternational.org or if you know somebody with a special needs child, autism, Down syndrome, cerebral palsy, whatever it might be, doman, D-O-M-A-N, international.org. We highly encourage you to go there. It's helped my family. It's helped Monique's family. And, and I was reading this just to wrap it up, Monique, we just have a couple minutes, but um, you said here, the most important thing is that he has hopes and dreams for, for his future. He, he told you, like you said, he, he wants to be a firefighter when he grows up. And then you, you talk about how now he tells you, I love you before he goes to bed. I feel like with some of these kids, and I think it's been true for us, and I think it sounds like it's true for you, that once you peel off the layers of these symptoms, when the symptoms calm down or go away, we end up with the child, the person. It's hard to get to that person until you get the symptoms dealt with by treating the brain. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And in, in both of our cases, because of Dome and because of these programs, we've gotten to peel back the layers of symptoms and gotten to this genius person 
that is Zakari, that is Ella Claire. So it's so encouraging to talk to you. I think people who are watching this are going to be really encouraged. Um, and I hope they, they go to Dome International. But thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me and letting me share our story. It's, it's really important to me that people know what happened with Zakari yes. so that we can have more Zakaris. Yes. Um, as opposed to, you know, frustrated children that and frustrated parents. Right. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Well, thank you. Congratulations on what you're doing. I think you mm -hmm. have treasures in heaven waiting for you, just like my wife. So <laughs> congrats and thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me. We'll see you next time. Welcome to Good Life. I'm Dean Wilson. I'm so glad you joined us today. Uh, you can always find all the interviews at goodlifetelevision.org. Uh, there's the full form interviews from this last year. There's about 70 of them. Um, and then plus a bunch of what we call power clips where we kind of take some of the gold, some of the great stories, some of the great moments from those interviews and we, we turn them into power clips. So we'd love to have you visit us there. And of course, we're all over social media as well, but we, we're so grateful uh, to have you with us. And I'm so glad to welcome my guest today. Kirsten Moore is with me. Welcome, Kirsten. Thank you. Good to be here. Um, Kirsten is the is the head basketball coach and associate athletic director at Westmont College here in Santa Barbara, California, where we are. Um, and Kirsten has an amazing story. Uh, I'll start with the basketball part, but in 15 years at Westmont, she has a 744 uh, winning percentage, won the first national championship in Westmont College history on the women's uh, basketball program. Um, and a lot of accolades uh, along the way. She played college basketball at, at Oregon four times in the NCAA tournament, and it's an amazing journey. She's been on uh, most of the incredible part off the basketball court is what I'm going to talk about. But but let's start with sports and basketball. Kind of where did you grow up, and were you always into sports? Was that kind of always something you were doing? Yeah. Um, well, I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area um, and uh, in Marin County, just over the Golden Gate Bridge from San Francisco. And uh, grew up in a real blue collar family, though, even though sometimes you say you're from Marin and people have this idea like, you're you know, sipping wine. Or, right, exactly. Right. Or, uh, <laughs> you know, think of it maybe like a Montecito type. Right, but, right, right. but my parents were super blue collar. My dad was a union electrician. My mom was an elementary school teacher. Um, they had both grown, grown up in San Francisco in the city itself and just had uh, time to write to get to Marin before it kind of uh, became as affluent an area as it is. Yeah. And um, they were able to raise four kids there. I'm the young, uh, the second of, of the four, boy, girl, boy, girl. And um, ever since I can remember, I have just had an affinity for sports. So my parents tell me my first word was ball. <laughs> um, my older brother um, played sports. And so I think, you know, some of it was just kind of growing up and wanting to, you know, he was kind of my hero and I'd follow him around, just wanted to do what he did. And uh, he played sports and he was just, he, he's always just been the kindest big brother looking out for his sister, for me. And so he was always good to let me tag along and play with the boys all growing up. And so um, my, my parents also coached both my dad and then my mom actually ended up getting into coaching as well. Yeah. Um, just, you know, like CYO youth basketball. Yeah. And, uh, but my dad was little league baseball coach and um, he drafted every girl in the league. Only three girls played little league baseball and uh, he drafted every girl on his team and <laughs> we won the championship. Really? So yeah, but uh, so just coaching parents and then, you know, my brother and I think it's just in me too. I've just, I developed just a love of, of all sports, but really um, started honing in on basketball when I went to Lavin basketball camps actually. Oh. And so what's funny, I know you've had John Moore on the yeah, show and yeah. It's kind of full circle that I ended up at Westmont um, wow. because, you know, Rachel Lavin running the summer camps and I used to go work out with her dad, Cap, and um, oh obviously God. Steve. And so that was kind of what showed me this passion into like, I want to play in college. And that's kind of what gave me that dream of playing college basketball was the exposure I got to it from Lavin basketball camps. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I tried coaching a little bit. YMCA basketball in Dallas. And it was vicious. Oh. 
I barely survived it. Yeah. It was it was a whole. Uh, so that's another program. Yeah. Uh, so you end up, and I have my Oregon Oregon green ducks tie on without trying. I just it just naturally happened. I know. I said that when you walked in. Yeah, I said I like the perfect. tie, the Oregon tie. You said I didn't even mean to. You should have no. played it off like you no. you meant uh, to. I should have. You should have. Yeah. It's very duck. It's very duck. Um, so you played Oregon, and you go to the tournament four times. I'm sure. You, I mean, it, it, you walked on. You ended up becoming the captain um, and having an amazing experience. Talk about kind of those years. Yeah, well, I I didn't re get recruited out of high school. I had this dream. I really wanted to play in the Pac-10, and um, but uh, didn't really have the opportunity to get seen. Also, maybe wasn't. I think the strengths that I had wouldn't show out, show up to most coaches that went into a gym and watched. You know, it was a lot of the intangible stuff and my IQ, my passion for the game, my work ethic, my leadership abilities with my teammates, um, those kinds of things. It was definitely not sheer athleticism. I could definitely shoot the ball, but um, but you know, was was not athletic. I would say for that level, mm -hmm. and so wasn't really recruited, but just had this dream, and then ended up getting an opportunity to go as a walk-on. I really felt like if I just got the chance to just get on a team that I could prove that I could help a team be successful and um, whatever that looked like. And, um, you know, for me that started for sure as like this passion basketball wise to like do whatever it took to prove myself that I could play at that level and also to help us win a championship. Um, I went there in just the, the second year of a new coach's kind of tenure at Oregon, and they had not traditionally been very good. And so it was really, um, I think, transformational for me to be a part of seeing a program grow over time from when I first went. I think we're averaging about a thousand fans a game. And by the time I left, um, we were averaging over 6,000 fans a game Wow! and, um, had one, um, and this was, I stayed there and coached for three years after. Right. So kind of those seven consecutive years by the end, we had won back to back, um, Pac-10 championships and dethroned Stanford, which was like a huge deal because they were winning, you know, going to final fours consistently in right. those days. And so, um, yeah, I think I learned a lot through that process of just seeing kind of that pro the program develop and being a part of that. I was never the star player or anything like that, but I, um, I think that those kind of intangible things that I said um, did help our team, and that's yeah. one of the reasons why you know my teammates voted me as captain, and then my um, head coach asked me to join our staff as a coach after that's that. So great, yeah, yeah. It is hard in in a workout to show all those intangible things you're talking about. Mm. You know, in, in a workout, in a three hour workout or two hour workout, I mean, obviously you can see athleticism pretty quickly, but yeah. all the other stuff, yeah. I mean, that is kind of a tricky thing. Yeah, and I mean, in recruiting, most of the time, like you're not even getting to work out. Like they're not, I mean, they would probably see the work rate that I would practice at would be probably different than most, but um, when you're just going to a club tournament and you know, you're just looking for like the player that stands out as the best player on that team or the flashiest player, right. uh, that was, that was not ever me. That's, that's right. for sure. So <laughs> who is the, who is the Oregon, uh, gal who, who's just was, is the best player in the country? Yeah. Sabrina Kobe. Ionescu. Okay. She was mentored by Kobe. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yep, yep. Unbelievable story. I know. I know. I saw her speak, I think at his memorial. At his or? memorial. She was, if, if you have not watched, for those of you watching at home, if you have not watched just her segment of, um, of Kobe's memorial, you should watch it it's because powerful. what she said, um, was really, I think just so pertinent to, um, yeah, just where I think Kobe was passionate about um, growing and developing in the women's game yeah. and um, yeah, and just needing advocates. And I think that was one of the hardest parts. 2020 has been crazy. And when I think about how crazy 2020 has been to me, it started with Kobe. Right. right? And right. Uh, and I think one of the hardest parts for those of us in the women's basketball community was feeling like he was probably the foremost advocate for the women's right. game that was alive today right. and um you know and not having him here anymore getting started exactly with Gianna. i mean we yeah. would so my boys play at mamba okay and so we were down there yeah two out of three weekends for yeah. a while and we'd see him yeah coaching with gianna who was unbelievable yeah but it was such a great story that it felt like we were in the first chapter you it, know? It, I, exactly Which and is so the, that's the hard mm -hmm. part and that's kind of been lost in this year because you know Everything, Everything else, else. yeah, yeah. How is this year's team? Before I kind of get off 
basketball? Yeah, I mean, well, we're a work in progress right now. We finally played a game, so that's progress. We had our first game this last weekend, two days ago. And uh, I would say, you know, it's, uh, that we're nowhere near as close as, uh, as good as we could or should be. Um, we return everyone from last year's team that finished ranked number one in the country um, other than one player. And that one player was definitely a key player, but we should, we've got the pieces to have a phenomenal team this year. Wow. So we just, there have been so many things and every team in the country is dealing with so many things. So we don't say that as an excuse. It's just, right. it's looked incredibly different than it normally would have because of um, all that everyone's having to work through with COVID. And, but and will this season, other than not having fans, um, and there's all the protocols, but is there going to be a full season? No, no, not even close. Uh, like yeah. 15 games? So we've just had our first game on what was that, December 5th, um, yeah. Saturday. Yeah, so um, I, we maybe will have three, I've, uh, hopefully have two more games this week, also against Division Ones. At Westmont, we have, um, we've taken a, a a pretty hard stance, but I think important stance that we won't play teams that aren't following a testing protocol that the state of California has set forth. And there's a number of our teams in our conference who are not doing that. So we will oh, not really? play a normal conference season. We'll play a few of the teams who are also following a testing protocol, but um, we feel like it's really important to protect the safety of our student athletes as well as um, follow the guidelines from the state and trying to do the right thing. Um, yeah. So right now, currently, the only non-conference games I have on our schedule are against Division One teams. Wow. Yeah. And then there will be a tournament, hopefully. There'll be a tournament. It's actually still up in the air whether they will test at that tournament. So it's pretty up in the air whether we will actually get the opportunity to play in that tournament. So oh, really? we are we are day to day right now for sure, um, oh. not knowing what the next day might hold, um, but just trying to be our best each day, which I think, you know, will kind of be a theme and probably as we talk about our story as of, uh, you know, kind of my approach to adversity and, and how yeah. I handle that. So, yeah. Yeah. So you, you, you coach for three years in Oregon, you end up at Cal Berkeley as an assistant. Mm -hmm. And then how did, you, you weren't in the Westmont world here. How did you get to the Westmont world? How did you find out about this? Yeah. You, what happened? Um, well, I mean, the short answer is I really believe like God brought me here and kind of yeah. brought this like kind of everything worked together at the right time and, and to to bring me to Westmont. But the uh, the story is really that um, after four years at Cal, um, our head coach was let go. So at that point, then the wow. assistants are looking for places. I actually that still didn't necessarily mean I was looking at making a shift from Division One. I. I had a lot of opportunities to stay in Division One, um, and uh, at, at a high level, you know, having been in the Pac-10 um, for my whole co coaching and playing career. And um, but I, I had kind of always thought down the road when I wanted to have a, a family and um, that I could see myself going to like a small, high academic school where I wouldn't have to travel as much, wouldn't have to be away from my family as much. And um, so I did, but I didn't think that was then, <laughs> you know, I was still really young, kind of just, you know, kind of moving up and doing well in the career. But then I started getting pursued by actually other teams in the conference um, to be their head coach. And so um, within a span of a week, I think I got offered three head coaching jobs in the GSAC and, really? um, and and they were kind of really proactively and I, I I still didn't think I would do it I just thought okay I'm gonna just but I'll go interview just for and and I was up front with them hey I don't think I'm ready to make that move but I'll interview just I think it'll be a good experience for me or whatever and so they said yeah we still want you to do that and so while I was at one of these opposing schools um, I uh, I looked up the morning I was going, uh, I looked up the job board to see what other new Division I postings there were. And there was one new post that day, and it was head women's basketball coach at Westmont College, and it said, contact John Moore. And I thought, oh my gosh, that's so John funny, Moore. John Moore, because I knew, so I pick up the phone and I said, hey John, it's Kirsten McKnight, you know, that was my maiden name. I go, Kirsten, I haven't seen you in years since Lavin Camp, you know, and he said, what are you doing? And so actually I'm on this way to this other school to interview. He said, you better not say yes till you come visit me and Rachel. So I came and I stayed in his house with him and Rachel and went up and checked out campus. The, they didn't even have an interview committee ready at Westmont yet for that step in the process. 
but he just didn't want me to say yes to these others before I at least checked it out, you know? And so <laughs> they got me like a quick, super short couple minutes with the provost because it was just a spur of the moment, like drive by on the way. Um, and uh, yeah, that's how it started and kind of wow. long story short, here wow. I am 16 the, years later now. Yeah, well, yeah. we can't lose you. <laughs> Dave, Dave Odell does tell me the phone rings a lot <laughs> about you. So, you know, stick around if you can. I, that's, I I've continued to choose Westmont. It's been, a, it's been an amazing place. So so let's let's talk about what it, May 9th, 2012. So you, you, your husband, Alex, who you met at Westmont, um, it was dealing with Crohn's disease and he had a surgery. Mm -hmm. And then, so my understanding is he has the surgery. He's okay. He sends you home to sleep, or yeah. you're in LA. He sends yeah. you wherever you were going to sleep. Yeah. What happened? Um, yeah, I was actually staying with the head coach at UCLA, um, Corey Close. Um, most Santa Barbara people right. know her from Amity. her time here, and so yeah. she's she's a good friend and uh, was amazing um, through this whole thing. Um, but yeah, we were staying because he was having the surgery at Cedar Sinai, so it was right there near near where she lives and so she was she she was letting me stay with her and um yeah I was at the time you know seven seven and a half months pregnant and uh we were expecting our first kid and he came out of surgery fine spent the day with him but then you know end of the day comes and he's like go home get a good night's sleep you know I was exhausted he was like I'm fine and um yeah at about four in the morning I was, I was asleep and I, I'd set my alarm to get up at five anyway to be there for the doctor's rounds. They make the rounds like super early. I wanted to be there the next morning, but um, I just, I was asleep and I kind of just felt I, like my phone kept lighting up. It was on silent other than the alarm, but it just kept like, like there was a light and I'm like, what's going on? I'm disoriented, you know, it's like the middle of the night. And um, finally, like it wakes me up enough to look at my phone and there's, um, bunch of missed calls from the unknown numbers and then like two voicemails so yeah listen to the first voicemail and it's the surgeon he says you know Kirsten's Dr. Fleshner and um, I need you to call me right away uh, your husband's actually he's in trouble he's actually coding right now and I just I just need you to call me and then like hang up so that's the like first message and then and then I so I'm just going like oh my gosh what's the second message you know and I listen to the second message and um it's the same surgeon he just says Kirsten I'm sorry but um I can't believe I'm making this call because I've actually not had to do this after a surgery like this before but um your husband didn't make it so um it he had had a pulmonary embolism um, a blood clot we don't really know still from where uh, in the autopsy afterwards they found a lot of blood clots in his body um, whether it was from the medication or Crohn's disease um, they don't really know but um, but yeah he'd had a and just just like that I was all of a sudden a widow and um, you know seven and a half months pregnant on the floor of Corey's bedroom just trying to breathe and uh, kind of in definitely in shock um, yeah nothing really can prepare you for a moment like that you know I mean, you had, there was no this wasn't on the radar at all no 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 like I didn't he, we had been doing long distance marriage for like four years and like we didn't even have our I didn't have his passwords to his bank accounts as we're still in Missouri and like I mean it was like not on the radar at all yeah so you come home to back to Santa Barbara and what are I mean what are these or what are the early days like for experiencing that kind of loss how do you I mean how do you how did you get through yeah um well I can tell you like the only way I've been able to like describe it to people like when that phone like I'm when I'm listening to those voicemails is it just it felt like darkness just went like yeah. like and just got like dark and like quiet and heavy like just you're just trying to breathe like literally thinking like breathe I'm on the I'm on the floor and I'm like beating my fist on the in the mat there was like a mattress on the floor and I'm just like there's no way there's no way 
And then I just kept saying like, I got to just breathe and take care of the baby. I got to breathe and take care of the baby, you know, like, and, um, but you know, it wasn't long, you know, Corey was there and she was amazing, um, by my side, but she immediately called, um, my best friends from here who got in a car, you know, this is, you know, four thirty in the morning and drove down to LA. And before I knew it, like a bunch of people from our, you know, our AD and other coaches, um, and kinesiology fac uh, faculty are there with me, you know, in Corey's house and spent the whole day there as I was trying to navigate all the decisions that have to be made in a moment like that. And, um, uh, you know, the, before that, you know, there's nothing you can say, but just the fact that they were just there, you know, right. like, and I just wasn't by myself. And before I, um, before they left, it was kind of like the end of the day. And um, before they drove, left to drive back up to Santa Barbara, they, you know, just said, hey, can we pray for you? And so kind of everybody in the living room got around. And um, I don't honestly remember anything that they prayed. But while they were praying, I just f felt kind of like this phrase, like over and over in my head and my heart was saying, like, like, God was trying to tell me like I was good yesterday and I'm still good today. Mm. Like I was good yesterday and I'm still good today. And I think that like step by step, I've tried to just um, trust in my faith of the promises that God can work all things for good. Mm -hmm. And so many times people take that kind of cliche biblical quote out of context like oh well if you believe in God good things are going to happen mm -hmm. I don't think that's I don't think that's actually mm -hmm. like in scripture but there is a promise that God can work all things even the bad things even the horrific awful things um, can work those together for good and I think the ways that I've seen that happen in the eight years since um, I don't think I'll ever get to a point where I say oh yeah, I'd choose that. Sometimes you hear, you know, people say like, oh, I'm so glad I got cancer because here's what I learned. Like, I mean, just being honest, like I don't think I'm gonna get to the point where I say I'm glad that that happened because of this. At the same time, I can see a lot of good that has been worked through the situation, including the way that this community in Santa Barbara on so many different levels, you know, like whether it was, you know, my, my team at the time, my coaching staff, like kind of that inner circle, my, you know, my friends, my church, the Westmont community, the Santa Barbara community as a whole. Um, it was really extraordinary the way that people came around me and my daughter. And when I share my story and I talk about my story, honestly, like that's when I get the most choked up um, and still have the most emotion is just thinking about the gratitude I have for the people that walked with me through the darkness. I told you it just felt dark. Um, but I wasn't alone, you know, and people came out of the woodworks and they helped when I didn't even ask for help. And they just, they were there, you know, every step of the way. And I think that, um, I share, uh, and in fact, I saw, um, as I was getting ready for this, I just pulled up your guys's website and I think there was like a little snippet and, uh, and I think you'll resonate with what, what I'm about to say, but you know, one of my favorite kids books I would read to Alexis was, you know, going on a bear hunt. Do you know this book? You know, yeah, going yeah, yeah. on a bear right. hunt, I'm gonna get a big one, <laughs> right, right. you know? And then it's like, uh-oh, a swamp. You know, you can't go over it. Right. You can't go under it. You got to go through, through it. it. Right. And I just think with hard things sometimes, yeah. like we have to go through, like the only way is through. The only way out is through. You know, but, I think that to know that um, you're not alone as you're walking through sure yeah. can help us, you know, right. take steps as we get there, you know. Oh. Oh. And Alexis mm -hmm. is her name. Yeah. She's eight. She is eight now. Yeah. How's in she third doing? grade. She's, she's thriving. I'm so grateful. So oh, grateful. Yeah. So. Yeah. So that happens. Um, seven weeks later, Alexis is born. And then. A lot of people, you know, would have taken a sabbatical, taken, and you decided to coach. Mm -hmm. And you, um, the end of the story is you win a national championship. And at one point, I mean, 
I, I, th th there's an article, by the way, if you're watching this, there's an article by Bill Plasky in the Los Angeles Times, which is incredible. Google it. Um, but it was it was powerful to hear him describe. I mean, the ba you have a baby, so you have this t army of women who are helping you with the baby. Yeah, we called them her sometime moms. Sometime you know, moms. Her sometime moms. <laughs> yeah. And then you're so she's on the bus with you uh -huh. in the car seat, uh -huh. going to games. Oh yeah. The the these women are helping you during practice. I mean. Oh yeah. And then. It, it culminates in the in, in, in and in fact when you won one of these tournaments and you're cutting down the nets, you're you've got a baby in your arm on the yeah. <laughs> as you're cutting the nets down. Yeah. I'm trying to. Yeah, I did that I think when we won the GSAC championship cutting down the nets and I thought, Oh baby, scissors <laughs> right, right. there's no hand to hold on, but anyway, <laughs> right. we uh we we survived that and other things. Yeah. It was a yeah, it was a that was a remarkable journey, a remarkable year. I think it, it's more remarkable when you know, like our team, like the, the logistics around the team too, because um, we had just graduated like 80% of our scoring and rebounding the year really? before. So we weren't like projected to, I mean, we certainly had, we had an all American best player in the country, Olympian and Tuche Janates, who's from Turkey. And um, so we had her coming back, but other than her, it was really just kind of, you know, a bunch of really hard working kind of pull up your bootstraps kids and uh, that just like wanted you. to fight. <laughs> and uh, and they yeah. To, so to, to to know not just like, oh, we won the national championship because that was the year you just had this incredible team. Right. Like it wouldn't have been the year I right. would have picked or anyone right. would have picked that said, oh, yeah, it probably would have been the year before that. Um, and we uh, we made it to elite eight that year. Um, but to make that run all the way to the national tournament was amazing. We wouldn't have been able to do it without so many people around us. Um, yeah. But even, you know, during, as we kind of started making the march through the national tournament, you have to win, we had to win five games in six days, which is so much harder than the NCAA tournament where you get yeah. like two games and you got a week to prepare. Right. I mean, it's like, it's every day and the turnaround time is quick on scouts and you're up all night prepping for the next game. and as we kind of started to make that journey through those games, um, yeah, you, it, it became pretty inevitable that any, everybody, that something special was happening. Like things were just coming together at the right time. Yeah. We played a team in the, um, in the round of eight um, to go to the final four that year that had come to our place in December and beat us by 32 points on our home court. And we played them again in the national tournament that same year and end up beating them wow. to go to the final four. Then in the final four, we played the undefeated number one overall ranked team. And that was the only game of the whole tournament we won by double digits. Every other game was like one or two possessions. But then the team we should have, you know, that was the heaviest right. favored. We beat, we beat by double digits, you wow. know. And uh, in fact, my... My uh, one of my assistant coaches now, Jill Heckman, who was Wilbur at the time, she was a captain on our team that year when we won the national championship. You know, she she banked in a three in that game really? against the number one team in the final four. And I just thought we're supposed to win this game. You know, like something is going right. right. Everything is going right for yeah. us. You no, know, gives me chills. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Bill Plasky actually said this is beyond the Cinderella story. Mm -hmm. Cinderella doesn't do You know, in, in that article, he says, you know, you want March Madness? This whole season has pretty much been insane, said Westmont guard Larissa Hensley. You're looking for one shining moment? There have been so many tears this year, Westmont forward Kelsey Sampson said, but there's also been so much joy. You know, I read, again, you know, going back to Alex. You got back to his office, and you're going through his office preparing for his memorial service, and you notice two post-it notes that are stuck to the wall that you'd never seen before. One read, encourage the oppressed, defend the cause of the fatherless, and plead the case of the widow. And the other one, be strong and courageous and do the work. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord God, my God, is with you. What did that mean to you? Yeah, I mean, it was crazy because his office is in the same building as mine. He was a kinesiology professor and athletics kines. We're, we're in one building. I can see his office. I was in there like every day. And uh, he was a cyclist, a competitive cyclist, and so he had some um, posters up um, of some cycling posters. And um, 
yeah, I went in there that day to try to find this picture for the memorial service, and I see these post-its that I'd never seen there before. And again, it's, it's kind of weird, right? Because <laughs> it's not like we're expecting... He wasn't expect. Right. We weren't expecting anything to happen. We weren't thinking of this surgery as potentially life-threatening at all. And um, yet I go in there and I see that. And the first post that I read is about, like, defend the cause of the fatherless and plead the case of the widow. And I'm like, whoa, that is crazy. My mom's with me. And we both just start immediately crying, you know. And then I look at the post it next to it. And, you know, my mom says, like, these are his last words to you, like to be strong and courageous and to do the work and to not be afraid or discouraged that God, his God was was going to be with me. And um, and that really that 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 verse became kind of the focal point for the whole team that year. I always have a theme for the team. And so it became, you know, we talked about strength, courage and doing the work as like kind of our our themes for that year and those were the things that we talked about those are the things we focused on and um and really like the big picture was way too overwhelming to like think about like oh yeah how are we going to get through this a lot of times you know like 2020 has felt overwhelming like how we deal with all the different things that are coming at us and um one of the one of the phrases i've always um kind of said to my team more than any other even before all this kind of stuff happened was i would always say the little things make the big things happen. I just think it's like a really important philosophy in basketball, but also in life, right? Like this that paying is. attention to detail, like the little things make the big things happen. And so I've just found in like situations where I feel overwhelmed and it just seems kind of too big that like if you can just narrow it down to what can I do right now to try to be my best, to maximize my opportunities, my potential, my skill set, and be the best I can be right now. And then, you know, for us that year, it became like, how do we just be our best today? It was, we didn't even, you know, most every year teams do goal setting. We didn't even set a goal to win a championship. It was like our goal we set was like compete each day, like just be our best each day and then it was like if we can string together enough of those best days then i really believe like you have the potential to overcome and and do things that that you might you know not think you're really capable of doing um wow. one of my favorite quotes i'll just share because i think it's so great is actually um i didn't know this quote at the time yet he hadn't said it yet dick bennett um virginia men's basketball um he, they, they lost in the first round of the NCAA tournament. They yes. were the first number one seed to lose to a 16 seed. That. This is a few years back. And um, he said in that press conference afterwards, he said, adversity, I believe that adversity when, when used correctly can buy you a ticket to a place you never would have gone otherwise. Yeah. And um, the next year they go, but they come back and they end up winning the national right. championship, right? And so I just think, wow. you know, obviously... Um, we weren't thinking like, hey, yeah, this is awesome. Bring on the adversity, right, right? right? But I think that when we're in it, if we can approach it, like if we can learn to respond correctly to it and see it as this like crucible opportunity to like be refined and to grow and to be stretched in ways, to be creative in ways you might not have had to be creative before, um, that that it can it can buy you a ticket to a place you maybe never would have even gone otherwise, yeah, you know? Powerful. So Wow. All things, that's my mom's favorite verse, Romans eight twenty eight. Mm. all things work together for good. And you, when you go through something like this, you're really thinking about all things? Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. It's not really <laughs> feeling like that right now. Right, this isn't right. feeling so good. <laughs> it's an amazing story, Kirsten. Uh, it's powerful. I think somebody should make a movie out of this, actually. Like, a, you know? There been a, there's been a, a decent amount of interest in that. Is it really? Books. Yeah. So we'll see if I can, you know not a lot of margin in my life right now to try to but i, I think that i think it's a great it could, idea it could it could happen down the road well, here like so. you see mcfarland remember that movie yeah, McFarlane? yeah yeah i can see like a i yeah. can see that yeah um be strong and courageous i think that's a great word for people who are experiencing loss uh, like you have but it's powerful what's happened and lots of lives have been touched and and you know you, you've been coach of the year you won a national championship my the favorite award that you've gotten and for me is the Pat Summit Most Courageous Award. Yeah, for sure. I thought, what a, that's perfect. Yeah. 
thanks for coming. Absolutely. Thanks for sharing your story. And Great to be here. Yeah, we appreciate it. All right. And we'll see you next time.